there's no inspection for today. So first announcement, tomorrow is baby room. <laughs> so I hope no one was born on the baby room. Anyone? Okay, no, good. So tomorrow is baby room, don't forget. And the second, we are not going to be happy about it. There's no department closing next week. Oh. So the next closing will be actually almost a month from now. It will be March, March 27th. However, it is going to be our annual health lecture um, by Andrew Knopf from Harvard. And he is going to be talking about system experimentology. So very exciting. Although there is no department um, closing next week, there is our lofty geology 393, 394 presentation next Friday. Phil, do you want to remind everybody where is it going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be in a new location. It's going to be in room 124. Maybe everything's on the building. Yeah. There are only 50, 50 presentations. All right, so. And then one of the most important announcements we have plus and minus three percent students visiting today, right? Eight, yeah. I do geography, so I always have to care about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have a man, then welcome them. Raise your hand and you know who you are. All right. <laughs> so lastly, I would like to introduce our department um, speaker today, Jacob Richardson uh, from NASA Goddard. So, um, um, Jacob did his PhD at the uh, University of South Florida in Tampa, um, finished roughly four years ago. And then after that, uh, he became a NASA NTT postdoc, working at NASA Goddard. So, after that, he became a, 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 a assistant um, scientist there. And then he also has a joint appointment at UND in the astronomy department. So you may or may not see him on campus once in a while, okay? So I will call Jacob as a volcanologist. Yep. So um, he's interested in pretty much physical volcanology um, and then, and then um, generally geophysics. Um, his PhD work relates to our solar system over geologic time. He's also interested in lava flow and magma pumping system or distributed um, um, system, sorry, distributed style of volcanoes. I cannot remember the other um, If you check out his uh, website, you will see there's a very interesting section <laughs> called Lava Flow and Placement, and it was someone sent to me. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. So today he's going to do that. He's going to be talking about exploring volcanoes in central Iceland as an analogs for planetary environments. And you can see he just took a boat, uh, selfie on, on the moon. So <laughs> let's see what he's going to be talking about. Welcome. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Um, Todd, is this a, where's Tom? Is this a good place to stand? OK, so um, yeah, so my name's Jacob. Thanks for having me. Uh, welcome, prospective students. Uh, yeah, and as, as uh, thank you, Mong Han, for inviting me here. So I'll be talking today about some work that I do, uh, and a lot of us uh, at, at Goddard Space Flight Center and then uh, around um, a couple of different universities, including University of Maryland, um, some of our field work that we do, uh, not on the moon, which is at the bottom, uh, but in Iceland, which is at the top. And I'll show you that more in a second. Um, but before I, before I start, um, I'd just like to give a little advertisement for NASA Goddard. So NASA Goddard Space Flight Center is, uh, as most of you probably know, right down the road in Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, and we are the, you know, the largest collection of Earth scientists in the world, but we also have a lot of space science. So I am a planetary geologist, so I'm in uh, solar system exploration uh, at, at NASA Goddard. And we have a bunch of uh, field geologists in the planetary group because, um, as I'll get to later, um, it's cheaper to study Earth uh, than it is to, to actually to, to make a commute to the moon every day. 
um, and study volcanoes there. Uh, so, we're, um, so we're a group of people, um, and I'll give a couple uh, shout outs to just a couple of us. Uh, Patrick Welly and Stephen Scheidt are uh, some of the people I go into the field a lot with, and then um, also Kelsey, David, Scott, Jake, that whole list, uh, and then even the bottom, University of Arizona. We all kind of go out into the field, so this is a real uh, community thing. Um, I'm certainly not going to volcanoes alone. That would be a very stupid idea. Um, so then if I put it this way, yeah, so I just want to, I really love this title slide, so I got rid of the title parts. Um, but here is sort of the, the, the reason why we do this. We think that some of these volcanoes that we see in places like Iceland or Hawaii are good analog sites for landscapes that we find on other planets. Here's a lava channel that is at that point uh, three years old in Halahun. And on the, uh, on the top left is my friend Sarah Sutton, a graduate student at University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, and uh, so this is, this is three years old. And then we have uh, three billion years old at the bottom on the moon. Uh, this is a picture taken by Dave Scott from Apollo 15 at Hadley Rill. So one of the questions that you might ask yourself is how does it go from the top graphic where uh, the rocks are very sharp and cobbly and uh, really horrible to walk around on actually to this really nice smooth lava channel over time. Also, what were the emplacement conditions like when this giant uh, lava channel at the bottom was in place? So that's one of the reasons why we kind of go out to places like this. So um, I kind of just answered this slide. So why study volcanism? Well, volcanism uh, is important for two reasons, whether or not, uh, you know, whichever planet you like most. Uh, the number one reason, or the science reason, is that volcanoes sort of evolve planets. They evolve planetary surfaces and planetary interiors. Uh, here's a nice uh, graphic that I think Carly Peters and, and Jim Head made of uh, three different types of planetary crusts. On the left, you have something that you see on the bright parts, the back side, or the, um, yeah, the far side of the moon, uh, where you have this heavily cratered surface and you have a, a differentiated body. But then, um, as you evolve your crust, you end up evolving it through having uh, mantle plumes and volcanoes that erupt as hot spots, sort of like the mare on the moon, or um, perhaps um, you know, places like Iceland or Hawaii. And then, uh, if you uh, continue, you can make really cool rocks, um, like andesites or granites, uh, in a tertiary crust. And that's if you have, perhaps, um, one of the ways that you make that is through plate tectonics, which we have on Earth, but we don't have anywhere else in the solar system. So um, it's also, though, that volcanism can be a good exploration target. You might want to go to volcanoes. Volcanoes are steamy. You can see this picture of Mount St. Helens. Um, Mount St. Helens uh, has a plume going in this, uh, in this picture uh, that's mostly water. These things uh, all over the solar system, when they erupted, might have also had uh, a lot of water coming out of them, and those might still be preserved in the pyroclastic deposits on these uh, planets, including the moon. So if you're interested in finding a resource like water, or finding perhaps an ore mineral, um, or perhaps finding a lava tube to hide in, volcanoes might enable your exploration of your planet. Um, another cool thing about volcanism is that uh, it's ubiquitous in the solar system. So here's a map of the solar system. Uh, I think this slide is sort of a homa an homage to a, a Nick Schmer uh, slide that he sometimes has, uh, but with volcanoes. Uh, so volcanoes are at Mercury. We see them at Venus, uh, Mars, the moon, uh, us, uh, Io. And then further out in the solar system, if you think of something that's uh, a different melt, uh, instead of silicate melt, you might have water as your uh, magma source. Then you have cryovolcanism at, um, where is that, Ceres, uh, Pluto, and then all sorts of places in between, uh, who knows. So um, uh, today I'll just focus on silicate volcanism, though, uh, my favorite kind. Uh, and you can see that there's, there are volcanoes all around the solar system. Here are just a couple of examples. Uh, the most volcanoes that are, the most um, volcano-littered surface of um, the solar system is probably Venus. On Venus, uh, you have this whole sort of area that looks like 
I don't know, really bad acne or something. That is a cluster of hundreds of volcanoes, and that's a small volcanic shield field. We have, we've seen volcanic plains that have um, tens of thousands of volcanoes within them that make up um, areas, patchworks the size of Nicaragua or larger. Um, Mars, zooming in here, you can also see uh, here's just one volcano um, making up sort of a shield volcano. And still, this is, st this is still a smaller volcano than what you might know on Mars, like Olympus Mons. And then on Marius Hills, on the moon, you also see uh, these sort of bumps all over the place and clusters. These make up, um, these also make up these sort of distributed clusters of um, volcanoes that are really interesting to go to. And then both of these have these nice little channels here uh, emanating from the summits of these areas of these vents, uh, which might have lava channels or might have once been lava tubes. So they're really interesting places. Venus, I don't think it really matters if there are lava tubes. I'm not going to go in one. Um, it's very hot at the surface of Venus, uh, hot enough to melt lead, um, which you might know. So let's talk about the moon for a second. There are volcanoes on the moon. Uh, this is, again, Hadley Rill. I just showed you this. And this is Dave Scott at the, um, you know, at just about to, to fall into it. Thankfully, he didn't. Um, these are some, the way we explore volcanoes on the moon are often with satellites. So these uh, pictures are from uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is, again, Hadley Rill here. So this is the source vent. And then this is, uh, this river-looking feature was a lava channel, active once. And I'll, I'll show you a video of that or a video uh, close to it, and then they landed right there. Um, and then this is, um, again, Marius Hills. One of the cool things about, uh, or one of, the, one of the most interesting discoveries during the Apollo program happened in 1972. In December 1972, uh, we had two astronauts in the Taurus Latro Valley. There was uh, Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt. Jack Schmidt was the only geologist to ever land on the surface of the moon so far. Uh, until maybe we get Jessica Watkins there in the future. Um, and uh, when they got to this crater, this crater was called Shorty Crater, uh, Jack Schmidt discovered orange soil. And maybe you can see this, uh, but there are sort of brownish spots all around this. When they brought that soil back, they found out that under a microscope, a lot of these particles, a lot of the soil were glass beads. And so they think that this was a volcanic deposit. These were um, sort of explosive magmatic events or volcanic events. And the orange part of the soil, which might look brown to us, but when you're on a gray moon for you know, three days, everything starts to look really colorful. Uh, this orange soil uh, somehow rusted, right? So it's orange, and that means that it's oxidized material. Uh, that's very important because in order to oxidize a uh, material like this, you need to have maybe some water present. And so when we thought that the moon was the driest place that we could think of in the solar system, uh, in fact, maybe the volcanoes could have brought some water to the surface uh, in the future. And so next time when we go to the moon, we're going to be looking for water to actually utilize on the surface instead of bringing all the water with us. And volcanoes might be one of the ways we do that. There are volcanoes on Mars. We all know um, of this one down here. This is called Olympus Mons. It's exactly the size of Arizona. If you're European, it's exactly the size of France. Um, they're about the same. Both France and Arizona are the size of Olympus Mons. Um, but not only are these very large volcanoes, um, you know, uh, not only were they emplaced on the surface of Mars, but uh, there are also smaller volcanoes. Here's a nice little vent that makes a smiley face inside of a crater. Here's the one I showed you a second ago. Um, and uh, what we found over the past couple of years is that there are thousands of these volcanoes littered about the surface of Mars, too. Uh, so it's not just Olympus Mons, but these, uh, these small volcanic vents actually uh, have been uh, erupting from over three billion years ago to uh, basically undatably young, maybe tens of millions of years uh, in age or even, even uh, younger. And now that we have the InSight uh, lander on Mars, we've been able to find, um, we've very recently been able to find, I don't even have a slide for it, um, uh, earthquakes that seem to come from a magmatic dike called Cerberus Fosse or Kerberus Fosse. 
Um, here's one uh, example of, here's another example of a Fisher event. One really key thing about these uh, distributed type small volcanoes on Mars that make clusters is that 90% of them are actually fissures. So they make these long scars in the ground and then you can see sort of lava coming out and maybe lava tubes that are, you know, at the resolution that you can see from this screen. Uh, when we think of volcanoes on Earth, we might often think that the vents are um, actually fairly circular most of the time. But on Mars, that's not the case. And that might tell us something about how hot these things were when they erupted, how quickly they erupted, what their fusion rate was. Uh, but it's sort of rarer or more rare on Earth. Um, but one thing that we don't really know, we see things all over the place on, when we look into these with um, uh, a nice camera called uh, the high-rise camera. We see um, all sorts of features on the inside. These internal cliffs really uh, were striking to me when I saw this. Uh, and then we have elevated rims too. But we don't really even know what the material of those rims are or the material of those internal cliffs. Are they lava or are they pyroclastic material from explosive eruptions? We don't know and we wouldn't know unless we necessarily you know, perhaps go there. Um, but that's important because if it's, if it's an explosive, these are all explosive deposits, then you can start to say that there was some gas inside of the magma, inside of the shallow magma, and that can tell you something about how um, these altered the environment when they erupted. So how do you study this? How would you get at this answer? Well, the gold standard would be to land there. Uh, here is a U-2. Um, from the Chang'e 3 lander, and here is, I think, Mars 2020, which hasn't gotten to Mars yet. But the gold standard is to actually get there, either with humans on the ground or with robots. You can actually touch the rock. Sometimes you could possibly bring the rock back, and you can study it as much as you want. Um, the problem is that landed science is very hard. Here's a map of Mars with basically no-go zones. Um, everything inside of these two lines are good to land at uh, outside of these and there's not enough sunlight to keep your rover happy for years on end so you want to land within those but anything in the gray or the black is too high in elevation to have enough of an atmosphere for your parachute to land your rover safely so you're really limited to just these areas here and here and here with our current technology and so and it's really hard to you know walk up these you know, for hundreds of thousands of kilometers to get to the volcanoes if you want to know how they formed. So it's, so landed science is hard, um, and, uh, but it's, it's a great pursuit if you can. Uh, but an alternative to that, again, is uh, planetary analog research. So this is an example that uh, we're of, um, of planetary analog research. We see over to the left, we see some pits on both the moon and Mars that we think might be lava tubes. Uh, and here, maybe you can't really see it, but um, here is an actual lava tube that you could get inside of if you want. Um, and we have some great uh, University of South Florida graduate students and Professor Sarah Cruza from USF uh, standing out with a, uh, a, a ground penetrating radar. And so they're able to actually march the ground penetrating radar over the lava tube to see, can we detect these lava tubes if we don't have a collapsed pit? Or if we do have a collapsed pit, do we know if the lava tube goes this way, or this way, or this way? We really need to know that before we decide to explore. And we really need to know if there's a lava tube at all. And so we're doing this research on Earth to develop this method to make sure that we know what we're doing by the time that we're able to get to the surface of another planet. So I'm going to talk to you, um, I'm going to give you two stories today about uh, what, how we're using planetary analog research uh, in Iceland. Uh, the two volcanoes I'll talk about uh, that are really near and dear to my heart are uh, here in Iceland. They're sort of um, in central Iceland. It takes about a day to get to from driving. Um, and actually, it takes us about a day and a half to drive from Reykjavik, where we uh, land and, and there's now a Costco there so we can go shopping at one place before Costco we'd go to the you know we would almost get there and then we go to the nearest grocery store and we'd literally buy a whole town's worth of food out from underneath them and they usually scowled at us so Costco has sort of helped with that there's no Costco on the moon um, just FYI 
So, uh, uh, so the, the lower one that I'll talk about first is this Holofern eruption, and then above that is a, a really cool stratovolcano called Askia. And this is what it looks like when we're out there. It's really beautiful, uh, and now it's more beautiful because we have these really nice tents. These are 15-person tents. So we have um, one of these tents ends up being our kitchen tent. One of them ends up being the place where we eat uh, and hang out after that. Uh, one of them is where we charge all of our equipment at night. And then uh, the last tent is for, for gear storage as well. And then we each sleep in our own separate tents. Um, it's also been a sort of pleasant last couple of years. So we've been able to go out uh, four times now, um, almost every year since the Holofrune eruption ended. And, um, and the weather has never um, fully cooperated with us, but it usually uh, cooperates against us. Um, but last year was, was really nice. I think I have a picture. Look at that. Uh, one of us is wearing uh, short sleeves. That was a first. We were so happy. Um, but uh, it, it was a really beautiful uh, time out there this time. So this is our campsite, though. And our campsite is at the, at the base of Askia. You can actually see this is a very volcanic landscape. And perhaps you can see this looks like a, you know, a planet. There's literally no vegetation to speak of in this, in this view. Uh, you're too high elevation for uh, the moss that grows on lava a lot. And then the, the rubble that's beneath our feet are uh, pumice from 1875. And then there's some basalt. Uh, blocks here too. So, but I'll talk about the the 2014 Holofrune eruption. Holofrune is uh, perhaps the greatest lava flow to study uh, because it is a it is the flood basalt of our lifetimes. So the last time something this big, so this lava flow is um, one and a half cubic kilometers. It was emplaced in about nine months, and the lava flow, the last lava flow that was um, that voluminous in that short amount of time and also above land was in 1783. And it was just uh, to, the, to the southeast of that. It was the Lockheed eruption. So this is really, if you want to study a flood basalt, a flood lava, this is the only one that we're really going to see in our lifetimes, um, most likely. So this is a really interesting eruption. Uh, the magma source of this was actually many, you know, uh, 50, 60 kilometers away at the Barda Bunga uh, uh, volcano. And then over time, uh, geophysicists were able to track the seismic signals uh, of earthquakes coming, uh, propagating away from Barda Bunga uh, that they interpreted to be a magmatic dike. And then after a while, it got out to here between Askia and uh, the ice sheet, and uh, the magma came to the surface and in place this amazing, beautiful lava flow. <laughs> this is what it looked like uh, on February 1st when it was erupting. Uh, you, can, you just briefly saw the outside, but this is the inside, this boiling cauldron of lava. And that lava, this is the volcanic vent. The lava is um, pouring out of uh, right underneath this drone um, into a, a main channel where Sarah Sutton was you know, standing in um, in this tidal slide, and you can see it's still very active. There's still, um, even though it's a sort of stable lava, you know, lava pond or ponded lava vent, um, obviously it's still very, you know, explosive. But this is after all the fire fountaining actually died down. So before this, um, before August 29th, this area was just a flat area with um, volcan um, uh, old lava flows from the 1700s. This is what it looked like in August 2018. Um, for scale, uh, I think that's me and that's Sarah. Um, and now we're inside of it. Um, and we're walking around. And you can see that there are a lot of you know, really cool features that you can see. Now you can start to see these internal cliffs that we saw on Mars earlier. And it's still steaming years later. In fact, if you go there, um, if you go there today, it'll still be steaming. Um, here are the drone pilots, I think, Stephen and Patrick. Um, but it's this really tortured landscape still. So we went in there starting in July 2015. Back then, it was a little too hot to sit down. Um, this is Patrick. Patrick now leads the field trips that we go on, uh, and I assist him on that. This is Shane. We made him carry the equipment, and he's not been back with us since. Um, <laughs> 
this, these are two other uh, folks of ours. This is uh, Liz Gallant, who actually graduated um, for, with her PhD, but instead of walking on the ceremony, she was with us, so she put on um, her outfit with us. And this is Sarah Sutton, uh, and they're both manning the LIDAR. So one of the things that we do, one of our objectives out here, is to get a, a high-resolution 3D model of this, uh, of this vent. And we've done that every year since 2015, except for one year. Um, and with that, we're able to actually model the degradation. So this is them setting up the LIDAR. If it runs, it might run. Okay. Um, this is a little fast. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a process. So we're working on ways, you know, this is not something that you would want to have as much of a complicated process if you went to the moon. You'd want something much simpler that didn't take 10 minutes to set up every time. But we set it up. It's a laser scanner, so it scans around. It scans the entire uh, vent. We take it down to another place where we see where, uh, so we can fill in sort of shadows from this laser. All right, and then they're setting it up, and that's about it. Uh, if we look out again at it, uh, at this vent, we can see, um, what is it? We can see all of these really interesting analogs to fissure vents that we see on Mars um, that uh, if we were able to see a vent that was only a couple years old, it might look like this, uh, but now they're very degraded. And here is me and Sarah. This is a very cool video. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this is what that area then looks like in, uh, in the laser point cloud, in the LIDAR point cloud. So here we see uh, purple points and, and bright points. This is all in the infrared, the near infrared. Uh, so this is reflectance. So you can see that we can, um, as we zoom in, that's the channel. And then we're going to zoom around very quick and, and fly back through uh, the, this chasm in the Earth. We can start to map out different features just using the infrared. And if you see all of these teleslopes that are uh, brighter, those teleslopes are recent degradation. And they're filling in the canyon. Since we've done this multiple times, now we can actually say we can start to quantify that degradation by seeing since 2015, this scarp has gone back, but it's filled in this teleslope. And with that, we're beginning to come up with uh, some sort of rate of degradation at time equals zero for a volcano. Um, you don't have to take our word for it that this is actually you know, paired correctly. We, have, uh, we, we were able to capture some video last time we were out of a rock fall um, that happened right, you know, right here. So these things happen discreetly. Uh, but then we found out that over the course of a couple days, the same scarp actually remains active, and it moves back uh, in slope and fills in. Uh, and each one of those boulders is about the size of our heads. Uh, and so we, we make sure to always wear proper protection when we're there. The biggest boulder that we see uh, that fell is this one right here, which um, is about the size of this table, actually. Um, yeah, so this is another view of the, of the Hollerhorn vent. This is our, these are some of our preliminary results. Um, we have, you know, they're getting better with every day, uh, but Sarah Sutton is getting her PhD working on this at some point. But this is uh, a difference map. So this is now a map of uh, the Hollerhorn vent. And uh, white colors mean there hasn't been any change. And then red colors mean there's been a net deposition, and blue colors mean there's been a, a net erosion. And what we can see is these nice things that look sort of like dipoles, where you have you know, high material moving downhill. So from 2015 to 2016, we had a little bit. And then as the year progressed to 2018, we see much more um, activity until uh, our 2019 model um, since 2015, we can see the entire area is degrading. And one of the things that we're, we're really seeing is that these are, this is two processes happening. On the inside, we have those rock falls like we saw in that video. On the outside, instead, we're, we have this much smoother gradient. And that seems like it might be something to do with a more, uh, something that might be uh, more characterized as diffusion. Here's an example of that. So in 2016, uh, we're starting to look at this with aerial photos now, so we don't have to walk into the, the dangerous vent. Uh, and this is what we get 
uh, in, with an entire coverage from, uh, from a UAV flown by Stephen Scheidt. And we can see from 2016, this entire uh, cliff face has now moved backwards, and you can see a bunch of rock, rubble. Uh, but going back to the planetary analog, we don't see, uh, so all of these internal cliff faces we see as indurated lava flows. We, we don't really see these collapse, uh, these collapse blocks re uh, collapsing and then retaining a cliff-like uh, face. They pretty much disintegrate all the time. So we're, we're sort of learning that the insides of the lava, f of these fissure vents on Mars are probably um, are probably not necessarily, are probably not degradation related. So the second uh, volcano that we're just starting to actually study is, is this Ostia volcano. There's a lot to do at Ostia and there's been a lot of research done at Ostia. Um, it's a great volcano, uh, but it's very ugly, so it's not very photogenic. But the inside is really this very large caldera, very beautiful. Um, it's about this, you know, as large as my laser pointer. But then we have, um, a six cubic kilometer lake inside of that called Oskivaten. And that lake was formed in 1875 when a giant eruption, you know, emplaced uh, a bunch of pumice all over the area. I think I have some better, a better view of it. So here, I can actually use this one. Um, so this is about a kilometer, and this is the volcano. And in 1875, Oskivaten was evacuated as a, as a lake from an explosive eruption that put down all of this bright colored um, uh, deposit, and that deposit is, is golden pumice, really beautiful pumice. Uh, later, in 1961, uh, there was another lava flow that came down, but it also made um, some local pyroclastic deposits of, of basalt. And uh, what we find really interesting is, as uh, people at Goddard, uh, who want to study these as planetary analogs, is that both of these occurred in the winter and both of these deposits buried snow that densified uh, into ice, and that ice is still there. So the ice from 1875 is still buried underneath this, uh, underneath this ash, and the ice uh, from or the, the uh, snow from 1961 is still buried as ice underneath that ash. And in some places, they're pinched together. We see evidence that this uh, process has also, or also happened uh, millions of years ago, maybe a hundred million years ago on Mars. Here are drop moraines at Arciamons uh, that are um, just to the west of the main volcano, uh, Arciamons, and it's thought that there might still be ice there that is preserved because it's blanketed by sort of geologically for Mars recent ash, and that would be about 70 million years ago to 100 million years ago um, ash deposits. So that could still be. So here's a, um, so what you're seeing in the main view is uh, an ortho mosaic that was made by Stephen Scheidt. It's at a, um, what, at an oblique angle, so you can kind of see what it looks like. The gold here is that golden pumice, and then all the darker stuff is 1961 ash, and then there's a nice trail that goes down. Um, and this is what it looks like from the inside, so it, it's very, I guess it is photogenic from the inside. Um, this is Viti. It's a little tiny volcano, uh, volcanic crater that occurred at the very end of 1875, and it has a pH of uh, 2.5, so like vinegar. Um, there are always people swimming in it, which is really weird. Um, <laughs> out here, it's very cold water, Oskivaten, um, but it's, it's, very, it's much clearer. And then if you walk down uh, the trail to the, to the shore of Oskivaten, you can actually see the 1875 stratigraphy uh, so you have, you know, surge flow or surge bed deposits that are very fine pulverized ash. And then you have this golden pumice layer that's really welded. And the pumice clasts are, you know, up to this size, maybe even larger. But then you can see that whenever snow falls uh, in this area and it gets buried, in this case by the snow would be, you know, from, the last, from last winter. Uh, and then you buried it from a little landslide just about the size of me. Um, then that snow sticks around. So um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but here I am uh, standing sort of in the middle of that field area, and there's a little ring of dark material around me that's a little lower than what I am. And we've figured out that these are likely thermokarst features. So this is an indication that there is still buried ice underneath my feet. 
um, that is in some way ablating away sort of as we speak or in the summers. How do we find this ice? We find this ice in this case with ground penetrating radar. So we have uh, Emily Shoemaker, our grad student. She's at um, University of Arizona now. And she, um, well, we brought out two uh, GPR antennas, uh, uh, 200 megahertz antenna that sees um, 10 meters, 12 meters into the ground, and a 400 megahertz antenna that maybe sees five, six meters into the ground. The way it sees, uh, in the way it probes into the ground is with uh, a transmitting radar signal from one of the antenna and then uh, inside of the shielded box, it goes down to the ground and then the radar uh, signals reflect off of uh, changes in um, electrical properties or changes in uh, layer density and it will come back up to another uh, a receiving uh, antenna. Uh, same, same goes for the 400 megahertz antenna. And uh, with that, we were able to uh, start to just drag it along different places. One of the first places we found ice was underneath this 1961 flow, and there was some water right here, so we were just testing that out. But you can immediately see as we, so this is a radar gram, and as we walk along here, uh, we're getting different traces at every, or 100 times in a meter. And at every trace, it sort of goes down and tells you what, is there any reflective material here? And so we see some layers immediately as we're walking. It's, it, you know, it's a pretty immediate gratification. Um, and this is, and the y-axis then is, uh, what is it? Technically, it's travel time, but you can also view it as sort of a depth. Uh, here are these thermocarst features uh, from that ortho mosaic again. Uh, this these are um, two people, and uh, this is the GPR I'll show you in a second, uh, but we, or the GPR scan that I'll show you in a second. And our, what we found is that we can actually find, detect ice that's buried underneath us. Uh, in this case, we see multiple layers. This layer right here represents the top of the ice table where it goes from just regular pyroclasts to pyroclasts that have poor ice um, with uh, between them, and then this lower level, which is at about 1.6 meters depth, uh, is the uh, is the the layer transition from poor ice to massive ice, and we were able to validate this, or we were able to sort of explore this with this with a power auger that we brought out that we were able to validate, um, or that we were able to bring up cores, and this is what we found is. Um, at this line, it has a pretty stark transition from uh, uh, scoria that has ice between it and just plain old ice. This is just an example of one of the nice places that we saw. This is um, a section that's, again, about a, you know, a meter and a half high. And we have uh, the 1961 scoria, or the 1961 uh, ash deposit. And then we have ice, and then we have pumice, uh, this golden pumice from 1875 sort of sandwiched between, and this ice has stuck around since the 60s. Uh, one of the really cool things that we saw there uh, once we started digging is that the farther you dig, not only does it become pure ice, but then it becomes completely transparent ice, and there's some gas in there still. So we're starting to get interested. The next time we go out this summer, um, our ice team is going to be very interested in actually collecting some samples here of the ice to see are any of these gases preserving uh, any volcanic signatures from any of these events or subsequent events. Uh, and could, we don't think because this is so um, modern that it would necessarily be able to help us date, uh, the, date the ice, but we think if we went to a place like Mars, if we find bubbles in the ice, then that can potentially, this ancient ice with ancient bubbles inside, could potentially help us reconstruct uh, the atmosphere at the time that the ice densified from, from snowpack or, or in any way. So the last thing I'll kind of show you is just a, a kind of a cool side project that we're doing. Uh, as it turns out, the second time we came out here, we found out the Apollo astronauts actually went out here. And so this is a view of them. This right here is actually Jack Schmidt, who discovered the orange soil. Uh, this is also Jack Schmidt taking a rock and saying, ah, that's a rock. Um, <laughs> and they actually camped at the place we camp. 
And uh, they were sent here by NASA because this place, not because this place is the most like the moon compared to anywhere else, but because this place was so foreign to everywhere they've studied in America. Uh, when they went to places in America, they were told this is a volcano, this is a canyon, this is a sedimentary rock. But here, everything was so weird uh, to them. Uh, the morphology is just so bizarre uh, that they were told, OK, go here, describe it, what do you see? And then they also, the Icelanders smoked a lot. Um, <laughs> it's just what happened. Uh, but they named this gorge where they really, uh, where they really uh, sort of studied for a long time. They named it uh, Nutigil, which sort of means astronaut um, right there but also means uh, Bull Valley, I guess, or Bull Gulch. So um, kind of interesting. As a um, sort of uh, outreach uh, product that we're trying to make, uh, since this is so close to camp, we decided that we would actually fly uh, this area with a Mavic 2 Pro, just something simple. And then uh, our pilot was able to reconstruct this model for it and shade that model. And uh, we're now trying to see how we can get this out into the public, and at least into the public in, in Iceland, because this is you know, exactly where they stood in the, uh, in the 60s. They were preparing to go uh, to the moon for the first time. And so that all just thank you. Thanks, thanks for coming. This is a very good question. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a huge question. And it's a huge question for where these fissure eruptions on other planets come from, too. Uh, so there are two thoughts uh, to that. I won't actually try to go back uh, a thousand slides to that really cool map. Um, but Holofrun did erupt along the spreading center between Europe and North America. Uh, some people actually, um, or one person uh, that w went out with us, actually stood across like a, a, the fissure in the ground and said, this is actually the spreading center, because that was the most recent place where Europe and North America actually split apart by a full meter and a half. You know? um, so it did erupt in and along the spreading center, but the, um, the magma source uh, was underneath that Bartabunga a larger volcano. It's a central volcano of Iceland. Um, it would look sort of like, um, or it would be one of the Cascade volcanoes if it was in the Cascades. It would be something like Medicine Lake or Lassen, but instead it's underneath a kilometer of ice in Iceland, um, so you can't really see it. But uh, what we don't know, or what people are trying to argue with, uh, to argue about right now, is um, did the rest of the magma, the magma that fed Holofrun, uh, come from uh, the crust sort of unzippering and the mantle, melt in the mantle actually just comes up through that crack, or did, was it laterally transported? And I think that there was a recent paper, I think by Hartley, who uh, says that this was lateral migration of the magma from Bartabunga, so it's not sort of uh, just purely mantle derived. Um, but there are more papers coming out all the time about this. So it's like, this is one of the places where you actually test that hypothesis because there's a whole other camp that always that thinks all of these things come from this unzippering effect. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, in the back first. Yeah, so um, yes, that's, that's, that's a really good question about um, the method. So the question for, for those listening on YouTube later um, was, uh, what are the, the pros and cons to terrestrial LiDAR versus uh, UAV cameras, perhaps? So we're using UAV cameras. There are UAV LiDARs. Um, they're expensive. Uh, but the, the cameras um, are really good at uh, getting a lot of coverage 
with very few shadows, um, data shadows. So we really like that. The problem is they're limited to places with good contrast, so they don't necessarily get the, the fine scoria slopes very well. The LIDAR sort of always sees exactly, very precisely where everything is in space, um, but it takes, you know, in this case, a week to get that data. Um, there are new backpack lighters coming out that are very fast, but they're heavy and walking around in this. Um, we actually call this place scamper hroon sometimes because you can't actually walk in it. You have to actually like sometimes get around and it's not necessarily safe. Um, so there are a lot of, you know, uh, uh, there's definitely pros and cons to both. Um, the LiDAR has a bit more fidelity but less data coverage is what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting lighter, but yeah, yeah, they're still heavy. Yeah. Yeah, it is cumulative. Is the rate, is it like getting faster? Maybe I can go back to this. So it doesn't, we haven't been able to figure out if it's, if it's going faster yet. We think, um, I will go back to this. This is a, not too far. Well, we're kind of, so this goes um, from uh, this year to, um, no, 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 this is, this is cumulative. So from, the first year, uh, 2015 to 2016, 2016 to 2018, so it's sort of doubled, um, and then 2015 to 2019. And so we've changed the scale here um, to sort of make, you know, give, give blue and red to, to each of these. Um, but yeah, it's, it's cumulative, and we don't see um, an acceleration of degradation, but what we were thinking we would see is a deceleration of degradation. The degradation of these really high slopes, friable things, um, most of that would occur in the first year, less in the second, sort of as an exponential slope like um, Chuck Wood thought in 1980. But um, we don't necessarily, s we haven't seen it slow down um, in how much it's degrading over time, which I, th I find fascinating. Um, so it seems to be a, a more stable process than we thought, but we're still trying to quantify, quantify that. Um, in the back? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. How do you compare degradation rates on Earth versus other planets? Uh, Earth has, has water, precipitation, uh, probably more wind from a denser atmosphere, so we expect that there is a lot, uh, that there might be more degradation happening here than other volcanoes. Uh, the other, uh, sort of the endogenous degradation process to this is that the inside of this volcano is cooking with time. So gases are still being released. Uh, there are still active fumaroles. Those are actually emplacing uh, gypsum and, and other sulfur deposits as we speak. And so we think that those might be weakening some of these rocks and causing some of these rock falls or, or making these rocks friable and ready to fall. And so that might be a way uh, for Martian volcanoes that are heavily degraded to degrade at, at young times too. So it's not all environment here uh, is something that we're starting to learn. Um. That was my main question, is how do you translate this to a lower gravity volcano atmosphere and cumulative Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so yeah, perfect question, great minds. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, actually, did you have a question? Oh, actually it was about the Martian uh, uh, skylight that you showed one that was a kilometer across. Mm -hmm. So the gravity might be the largest thing. So the way that tubes form um, uh, is s usually from a crusting over of a, of a lava channel, like you know, the one you know, up here. So if you crust that over and you're able to keep that stable, um, it can create sort of a, an arch. And um, in, in other cases, it can 
uh, you can in place a sheet, and then underneath that sheet you have a molten core that can end up making a, a tube as well. So uh, in both of those situations, though, you need to have a, uh, a sort of stable top to a stable roof. And that roof is more stable when there's uh, you know, less gravity. So that's, that's pretty much the, the biggest way uh, to, to um, make larger stable tubes when you don't have those on Earth. But we also don't see large uh, channels uh, that, are that are kilometers wide forming in lava flows on Earth. And either that's because we just don't have those big lava flows happening every day, thankfully, um, or uh, perhaps there's something about the, the actual lava effusion rate that's changing that. And we think that might be higher on other planets um, as well, yeah. Yeah, we all, uh, you know, we go to a lot of places and we always need somebody to carry tripods, so, um, you know. Yeah, we can do that. Um, but yeah, so there, I mean, there are ways to get involved. If you're really interested in field uh, science, I'm sure there are lots of people here, but um, I work really closely with Nick Schmer, so um, if you want to come out into the field with me, uh, then you can probably talk to Nick and he can see about it, yeah. But um, yeah, Iceland's, Iceland's a cool place, so. Um, I don't know, get out there if you can. It's not layers. Um, so these are drop moraines. So uh, each one of these lines would be a, a, a thin ridge, uh, not an esker because it would be, um, let, maybe you can't tell, but upslope is over here. So this is like our Siamons right here. And then downslope, and then the flank sort of ends right here, and you end up with these drop moraines all the way out. And so these, um, these are very extensive, so the ice might have been very thick at some point in Mars's past. Uh, a couple of, or the people who've tried to date these, date them at around 100 million years ago, maybe uh, 100 to 200 million years old. Uh, but yeah, each one of these ridges uh, might still have cores of ice along them, just from, you know, from um, I don't know, some studies have, have said that these are probably just drop moraines with, with ice nuggets. And so if you have these buried at, at depth, they would be stable at Mars. Uh, and then the, the layering, the only real uh, material that could be deposited on them would be uh, ash from Arceumons, because there's not really a cliff for talus to fall on. No, if you want really thick layers of water, then you go to the mid-latitudes. Um, there are still probably kilometers thick uh, glaciers of, you know, of ice, of water ice uh, to drink there um, that are also covered in, in that case, there would be sort of talus or um, you know, other deposits that aren't necessarily ash um, or more far-flung ash. But yeah, it's still kind of a, a good analog, though. This thing. Oh, yeah. Down or the next one? The next one, yeah. That one. So, is it, what controls these guys? Because it seems like they're all on that, like, one or the two terminal thing. Yeah. Like, is there something that controls these guys? Is it just, like, that's the region with the highest gradient? And so that's why all of the. Um, so, that's, it, there's a complicated answer to where, or what's triggering these, or what's setting these things up to, to sort of fail. But yes, this area right here is, um, so all of these areas, um, or most of these areas do actually have 90 degrees completely steep uh, cliffs, but these sort of are the tallest, or were the tallest, at the time of uh, uh, cessation of the eruption. And that's because most of the uh, fire fountaining was concentrated down here at the south. Um, we think, so, so yeah, they're taller, but they're just as steep. And even after, um, one thing that Sarah uh, has figured out, the grad, um, our, our grad student um, has figured out, is after they fall, they actually still leave a, a smaller vertical face um, afterwards. So there's still a vertical face, no matter, you know, almost no matter what, until you sort of cleave it off. Um, there is also a, um, what is it, a fusion story there. So places where, there, where the material was deposited hotter there, it is more welded together. The spatter 
uh, is more welded together, and we think that that creates uh, more stable surfaces that we see in these areas. Um, and they're just you know lower, fewer, um, very tall, steep areas up in this area. So you know there are a couple stories here, yeah. Um, yeah, so generally you have, um, you know, it's, it's Iceland, so there's always sort of mist, um, but we don't um, have a really good grasp on how uh, serious the rain gets, but I don't think that um, this is sort of an Icelandic desert, I guess, so it's always misting, but it's never... Yeah, so, I th so one thing where we know it's related to the water cycle is that in rainy years that we've been out there, uh, it actually makes the entire vent steamier because the groundwater is, is recharged. And that groundwater, when it hits the lava at the bottom, it turns into steam and advects through the vent, and that's what's sort of cooking it. And, um, yeah, so, and we think that that's a primary aspect of this. So, so rainwater probably does have a couple of ways to, to help degrade our, our volcanic vent. Yeah, these are the perfect questions. So here we see, I'll, I'll, I'll go backwards with this. So here, so the um, orange parts in that, in that orange soil, we see very clearly inside of the spatter rampart. So we see inside of, inside of this volcanic vent, um, we see all these orange areas. These orange areas are oxidized in, um, in the same way that these um, glass beads would have been. The glass beads aren't forming on Earth, um, we think, uh, be, I mean, these glass beads are, are microns wide, and we think that's uh, because uh, any amount of gas in a magmatic dike at the surface of the moon is going to be uh, sort of exposed to a vacuum, and that's going to completely fragment your magma into small microscopic glass beads. Here, we have a great atmosphere um, that doesn't fragment that lava so much, but it does create you know, still some fire fountain. Um, when, let's see, the other thing is, is the smoothness. Let's see if we can go back to 2000, the 2015 view. Here we go. So uh, when we first went into this vent, we saw a lot more of these very sharp cliffs. And over time, those cliffs seem to be, again, degrading. And, and forming these really shallow, uh, or these, these talus slopes that are pretty much at the angle of repose. Um, and a bunch of these, some of these are made out of um, sort of cobble size, maybe um, you know, small boulder uh, sized rocks, but some of them are really sort of cobble and granule, like, like the talus slopes are really disintegrating. All of this rock is very friable, and that ends up leaving um, a sort of smoother talus slope than the, cr than the rocky crags um, that you see from this, from this fresh basalt. So our hypothesis is that over the course of you know, thousands of years, this entire area will turn into sort of a smooth, um, a more draped feature that you know, completely degrades. But you know, we won't be around for thousands of years. So.